much better. I didn't expect that every time. <laughs> Before I kick off and talk about me too, um, I would like to invite up Lori Emerson from Menu Vermont to kick things off. Thank you. My name is Lori Emerson. I'm the executive director at the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Vermont. And NAMI Vermont's mission is to support, educate, and advocate for communities and individuals and family members with mental illness. And we do that through many different ways. With our educational programs, we're able to offer family members information about how to help their loved one, as well as coping strategies, a crisis plan, and as well, other programs that we have are our support groups. We have support groups for both family members and individuals with mental illness, which really helps people connect with one another so that you feel that you're not alone. You get to share resources, coping strategies, and, and you just feel like it's a second family to you when you need someone to talk to. Other things that we do at NAMI Vermont are presentations. And some of our presentations, we want to reach younger students. We want to even reach elementary students. So some of the things that we, we have to offer are a coloring book, Blue Blue Monster, um, where they get to explore their feelings and able to talk about their feelings. So we've been presenting our Any the Silence presentation to middle and high school students. And counselors are, are telling me, we need to start younger. We need to start elementary school. So we're starting that conversation. And we're trying to open up that dialogue. And that's what NAMI Vermont does. It's our core competency as our lived experience where we share our stories and we let people know that they're not alone. And with Me Too, you're breaking the stigma. You're breaking barriers by just being here and enjoying the music, being authentic. And that's what we do at Nami Vermont as well. Tomorrow we have a conference and um, we're back in person finally. So it's, it's gonna be a great day. We've got over 220 people that are registered. So we're very happy that people are coming out to meet in person again. And we also have um, a lot of advocacy work going on. We're advocating at committees, advisory groups, work groups. We're advocating for mental health awareness as well as legislation because we want everybody to feel like they belong. So I want to thank the Me Too Orchestra for inviting us to be here today. And we'd love to have you folks involved with us. We're a volunteer organization. But we do have a paid presentation available for people who want to do presentations for us. So we hope you'll get involved with us. Thank you so much. Welcome. My name is Marguerite. I'm a member of Me Too Orchestra, and it is a tradition for our orchestra to commence with a breathing exercise, a mindful moment to get ourselves centered. And today, I invite you all to join us as well. So, please, put your feet flat on the floor. Drop your shoulders away from your ears as you can. Close your eyes or lower your gaze. I will count our first breath, and then you will take three more on your own time. All right, let's breathe in. Two, three, four, and out. Two, three, four.
it's me again. Thank you all for coming. I keep on looking over the balcony and being excited that there are people up there. What a great view. My name is Phoenix Crockett, and I am the managing director of Me Too Burlington. I've been in this orchestra for a long time, first as a musician, and more recently in the management position. Each week, this group of awesome musicians who I feel very connected to, who I love very much, gets together and tries to create what we call our stigma-free zone. Now, what that means is we all know that there's a certain stigma that can be associated with mental illness, right? We want to try to set that aside intentionally, on purpose, so we can come together and enjoy our love of classical music together, somewhat outside of that. Many of these musicians live with mental health diagnoses themselves, or have loved ones who do. We've been doing this for 13 years now. This is the first concert of this 13th season. This show is dedicated to honor the memory of Tim Swanson. And now, the whole thing for nothing. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this performance by the B2 Burlington Orchestra. We are uh, happy to bring this program tonight to you. Uh, 
that uh, has a bit of a dance theme. If you looked at the program, you may have noticed that dance shows up in a lot of the titles or uh, other uh, titles that suggest movements of different dance styles. And so um, uh, this is kind of the theme that um, is established by the very first piece that you've heard here by Johannes Brahms, his classic uh, Hungarian dance number five. And in many ways, Brahms really kind of created the template for a lot of other orchestral composers when it came to finding ways to incorporate dance into classical music. Uh, for anybody who's heard of Brahms' the symphony, you know how incredibly uh, serious uh, a composer he was. But Brahms also had a much lighter side. He loved uh, folk music in particular and folk dance. And so he created these Hungarian dances to kind of uh, give himself an opportunity to explore that side of his musical personality. And in so doing, he really did, as I said, create a template that has been explored by many, many other composers as we are, are going to see in this program. We're going to switch gears here a little bit from the kind of high energy, uh, intense dance that you just heard for a much more sedate and stately kind of dance known as a pavan. So the next two selections that you are going to hear both have the same title, pavan, but they're very different interpretations of that dance style. The first comes from the French composer Gabriel Faure, and his pavan is very stately, very beautiful, um, really almost rhapsodic. The second pavan you're going to hear is an entirely different take by the American composer Morton Gould. Uh, Morton Gould uh, was really raised um, on American jazz and popular music and really incorporates that style into so much of his music. And you're going to hear that in his pavan, which is a much more lighthearted approach to this dance style. So these are two very different pavans, Gabriel Faure and Morton Gould. Thank you. 
earlier the importance of talking about lived experiences. So now we will engage in another tradition of the Meeple Orchestra, where one of our orchestra members comes and addresses the audience. Agree? Hello again. You might remember me from earlier. I asked you to breathe. Don't worry. I won't ask you to do that again, but please feel free to continue to do so. Um, I stand up in front of my orchestra every week, uh, but this is the first time I've done so in this capacity to 
share a little bit about my story. So here's a little background on me. When I was five, I was invited to my friend's violin concert. Um, and though I don't remember it specifically right now, it must have made a big impact on me um, because after the concert, without any prompting, I marched my little Mary James right up to the front where the teacher was and told her I was going to be taking lessons with her starting immediately. <laughs> and true to my word, here I am 25 years later. I took lessons from her for 12 years and continued my musical journey throughout my whole life. Now, I know my five-year-old self could, could express it, but as an adult, I've found that in order to be the master of my emotions, I need to, be, to find the opportunities to create beautiful things and to collaborate with like-minded human beings. I gravitated towards the creativity that my instrument gave me, uh, but with this glorious discovery, a newfound fear also reared its head, being heard. <laughs> Uh, music as a solo artist has always paralyzed me because it means I'm on display. I'm bearing my soul out for anyone to hear and judge. Auditions were the bane of my existence, easily the worst day of the year. But I pushed through because I knew on the other side there was a safe haven uh, that would salve the wound, uh, a collaboration through orchestral music. I found an avenue that gave me cover enough to sing out because, tried and true, there is um, safety in numbers. So when I moved back to Vermont, after being away at college and then being abroad, I again was hunting for something to fill my musical void. My friend Annie Kopic told me about this organization called Me Too, a community orchestra that did not require an audition to join. I did not need any more information. I was ready to sign up right then and there. Uh, <laughs> a little did I know that this organization and its mission was going to give me all that I hoped for and more. Not only do I fill my musical, creative, and collaborative bucket with these incredible people every week, I still uh, have uh, found out that after two decades plus of playing music, I still have things to learn, and I have grown a new confidence in my abilities. Last season, for the first time ever, I was told by our conductor that I was playing too loud, and I needed to quiet down. That has never happened before. Uh, and um, last week, when I played my violin in front of my kindergarten class, which happens multiple times a year. Um, it, it was the first time I played without combating shaking fingers. So in the last six years, Me Too and its stigma-free zone has helped me settle into my musicianship like never before, with confidence to play like I'm not being judged. Because guess what? I'm not. Thank you all for being here. sharing your story, Marguerite. And I don't remember telling me you played too loud. So. <laughs> We're going to continue our program with the music of Samuel Coleridge Taylor, uh, a black uh, British composer from the 19th century. And um, although he uh, was born and raised in Britain, uh, Coleridge Taylor was very in touch with his African heritage and in fact uh, created a work that he entitled 24 Negro Dances that was inspired by Johannes Brahms and his Hungarian dances, we heard from Brahms early in this program, and Antonin Dvorak with his Slavonic dances, which we're going to hear later in the program. So you can see these points of connection between these composers, and this was a very meaningful connection for Coleridge Taylor, who was really hoping to kind of create the, the kind of uh, experience with these dances that he had uh, experienced himself as a musician uh, with the music of Brahms and Dvorak. One of these dances in particular really kind of stayed with Coleridge Taylor, and it was a dance called the Bambula. And so when he got a commission from an American uh, source uh, to write a work for the New York Philharmonic, he decided to keep working with this particular dance. He thought there was so much potential in this dance, 
And so you're going to hear really fully and richly explored in this work that he called The Bamboo I Walks the Rhapsodic Dance.
we are going to uh, depart from our dance theme momentarily for reasons that will become obvious in just a moment here. As uh, Phoenix mentioned at the top of the program, we are dedicating our concert this evening to a former member of B2 named Timothy Swanson. Uh, we lost Tim earlier this year. Um, and uh, before saying anything else, I want to acknowledge that we have Tim's mother, Hope, here with us this evening. Hope, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. And it is with Hope's permission and encouragement that we want to be as honest and forthright about Tim's passing with all of you. And to let you know that Tim, sadly and tragically, took his own life. This, of course, will be devastating to any community, but especially to a community like you two, for which mental health is such a core part of our mission. But for several reasons, we really thought it was important to, to, to share with this with you very honestly and candidly. First and foremost, uh, Hope shared with us that, that, that it was her hope that by sharing um, this message that others who are struggling with anxiety and depression, as Tim did, may not feel quite so alone. The second part of uh, the reason why we feel like it's important to share this is, uh, as I said, you know, mental health is really uh, what Me Too is all about. And you've heard the phrase stigma-free zone. And uh, I don't think there are many things that carry more stigma than taking one's own life. And last, but certainly not least, is that Tim was a very honest and forthright person himself. He spoke very freely about his own struggles. And in fact, in his own obituary, which I know that Tim uh, had a hand in, a very beautiful obituary, in the very first paragraph, he talked about how he came to the decision after months and months, and honestly, from what Hope has told me, perhaps years of struggling with anxiety and depression. And that he did not reach this decision lightly because he knew the incredible sadness that this would bring to his family and loved ones. But for him, this was the only way that he could find peace. And I think it's really important that we understand struggles that Tim went through to the best of our ability, that as advocates, as allies, as friends, loved ones, as supporters, as members of this community, it is incumbent upon all of us to always be uh, in touch with what's going on in the lives of people that we know, whether those are friends or family or colleagues, and that we are doing our best to reach out, to support, most importantly, to listen. And of course, we all long for, we all pray for those success stories, of people who can overcome these feelings of depression and anxiety. But it's, that's not always the way that these stories end, and it's important that we, we realize this. But the other thing that is so important, and what I really want to emphasize here tonight, is that it's important to, that we not allow the manner of Tim's death to overshadow our admiration for Tim's life. Because Tim did indeed lead a beautiful life. He was kind, he was generous, he was gentle, um, and he was so giving. Now, I don't pretend to have known Tim well. I only knew him for, for this last year. But from even that brief time that I knew Tim, and more importantly, from all the wonderful stories that I've heard about him, how kind, how patient, how giving, especially how generous he was. Especially in terms of his incredible musical talent. He not only played with me too, but with several local groups here in Burlington, several of which I had the chance to hear at a memorial service that was held at the Shelburne Vineyard a few weeks ago. And it was so clear to me, and the music that was played and the messages that we heard how incredibly generous Tim was. One last thought I want to share with you is that uh, I chose the work that you're about to hear, which is the Nimrod Variation from Edward Elgar's uh, Enigma Variations. Um, several weeks ago, just feeling instinctively that this was the right piece to, to play to honor Tim's memory. 
And we've only found out just recently from correspondence between Hope and Caroline Whitney, our executive director, that Tim specifically asked that this piece be played at his memorial service. Because, in his words, and we know this from Pope, this was perhaps the most beautiful piece of music that he ever played. And so the opportunity to honor the beauty of Tim's life with the beauty of this incredible music is, um, is just so meaningful to us. So we now, in honor of Tim Swanson, present Edward Elgar's Numeral admiration from the Indian Empire Nations. I know that the words that were just shared and the music that was just shared can be a lot to hold. So it's at this time that I mention my day job. I'm a health professional. If anyone wants to talk after the show, please do. 
I'm here. That's part of what we do. On the other side of things, now that we're all here together and in the room and experiencing the wonderful advocacy work that NAMI does and that V2 has done, I'm going to get to the last tradition of the night, which is, at every show, we do a Q&A. Now, I know I didn't give you time to prepare questions. But I want you to reach on inside there, anything that you've been wondering, and throw it out to me. And if I don't know the answer, I'll point to someone who does, or say that I don't know, which I have to do not know. Nothing can see, by the way. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> this question is, where does the Tiffany go after the show? Into my Kia Sedona. <laughs> that is where it will go. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we have like a closet for it. <laughs> we typically practice at the Robert Miller Civic Center in Burlington at 130 Goss Court, should you ever want to show up at 7 p.m. on Tuesdays. And then you can see the Tiffany in all their lovely glory. We play at the Robert Miller Civic Center at 130 Goss Court, Burlington, yes. Yes, sir. Do you have a local church you're associated with or looking for other volunteers? We are not currently associated with a local church. We will always accept help and support. What range of ages do we have in the orchestra? Now, I don't want to call anyone out. <laughs> but I do know that we have players in our 70s today and we have players in our 20s today. When I started many years ago as a wild-eyed 18-year-old who very much needed the direction, um, there was someone who was playing behind me who was either 90s, and we had a 12-year-old at the time. So we're pretty open to players. Yes, sir. You have a need of donation of instruments. The question is, do we have a need of donation of instruments? It's not the first time that that's come up today. I've never personally accepted a donation of an instrument, but we surely would, especially if there are people in the community that we knew of that uh, would love to play with us, but for want of an instrument, if that situation came up, that would be lovely, yes. And speaking of donations, there is a box for cash or checks or other such things out front. Yeah, right? It's like I practiced. Or you can go to our website, there's a, there's a gift page we do run. Of course, entirely on donations. We are a 501c3, blah, 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 nonprofit organization. And almost all of our funding comes um, from uh, grassroots stuff, from small donations from people like you who see our shows, who believe in our mission, and you think that we deserve that support. I love the question. <laughs> when are you coming back to Brattleboro? When are we coming back to Brattleboro? It's not currently in the works, but it's going to happen. We love SBAC. We love that venue. They treat us very well now. Yes. I'd like to know what a musician gets out of the membership of the orchestra that they wouldn't get if they were not members. The question is, what does an orchestra member get out of their membership with us if they do not get? What was the second half? If they weren't in the orchestra. If they weren't in the orchestra, I think community, especially this supportive of our community. I mean, this is my job. They they write me a paycheck to do it and come here and say these things. Um, but I would show up anyway. How many of you can say that? <laughs> because I appreciate this community, because it's been supportive of me, we've been supportive of each other. Yes, the music is important. And yes, it's nice that all these really, really awesome musicians come together and do this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the people, it's the community that we're here for. Hi. How many of the 
How many of the group, both sitting up here and sitting out there, were here in the very beginning, right up top? Yeah. <laughs> and we appreciate your dedication. We love you, Margaret and Richard. <laughs> and Carol over here, too, as well. Hi, Carol. Did I miss the part where you talk about the challenge permit? <laughs> this is where I get a line from my boss. We're going to get there, we're going to get there. But, you want to talk about it? I'm happy to. Sure. <laughs> Very quickly. Um, I, know, I know Phoenix already brought up um, money. Um, but I did want to point out, there's a sheet in your program book that makes this very exciting announcement that we recently received a $250,000 challenge grant, $50,000 a year for five years, which is amazing. Um, Dolores Weaver is 86. She lives in Jacksonville, Florida. She's a full-time philanthropist, and this is a no-brainer for her. She's all about putting more beauty and uh, just good things out into the world, and she has taken us on as one of her projects. But I want to be clear, this is not one of those things where it's like, yeah, she'll just give us the money anyway, because she won't. <laughs> she is tough. We have to raise the matching funds before she'll do anything. So new and increased giving, that gets us to the finish line with Mrs. Weaver. Thank you, Phoenix, and thank all of you. Thanks, <laughs> Burning questions before we go on. I want to hear them. Some of you who are here know this, but a long, long time ago, I was a teacher, so I have a great waiting time. <laughs> <laughs> but if not, we want to thank you guys so much for coming out. I will be addressing you again. This is awesome to see this room full of people who are here for music and mental health advocacy. Some of you who will be at the conference tomorrow at the Andy Vermont conference, you'll see me there. I'll be at my table, I'll have my projector. We'll also have Alex providing us some lovely music. It's gonna be a great time. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Phoenix. We're gonna wrap things up here. Uh, kind of where we started uh, with some uh, dances from Eastern Europe. Um, and, uh, beginning the program, it was the Hungarian dances, uh, as realized by Johannes Brahms. We're going to finish up with the Slavonic dances of Antonin Dvorak. Uh, Dvorak was a few generations younger than Brahms. Uh, was so taken with Brahms' Hungarian dances that he decided on the spot he needed to do this for his own culture. And uh, thus we have his wonderful Slavonic dances. We're going to play number four and number eight. Uh, we uh, again thank you for coming out to uh, share your evening with us, and we hope you enjoyed this performance. Why we do.